UFC 281 betting and DraftKings show. We have 14 fights this weekend, $200,000 to first place on DraftKings. I'm John Kelly. Let's hear the picks. Kicking things off in the light heavyweight division, we have Carlos Olberg coming in as a small minus 130 favorite. The comeback on Nikolai Negamiriano is plus 110. And this is a spot where I do like the Carlos Olberg side. I feel like most people favor the Olberg side in this matchup, and it makes sense to me, right? Like, you have a high-volume striker, clearly has knockout power. Obviously, the, the UFC cardio dump against Kennedy Zichuku is not a good look, but it was his UFC debut, and he landed a ton of strikes dominating that fight early before he death gas and I think that's kind of lost on a lot of people here and I expect him to have a significant advantage in terms of the striking Nikolai Negamariano has never been a good striker like we like him because he's pretty durable he has a lot of heart he's willing to just go to war eat some punches maybe mix in some grappling here and there I just don't trust him to do that at a high rate this guy only averages around one takedown per 15 minutes his grappling has been proven to be not very good and I think Olberg is just going to have a massive of striking advantage. I mentioned how hittable Nikolai is on the feet. I think that's a big problem in this matchup against a, a bigger, more powerful striker in Olberg. I think Olberg's going to jump out to an early lead here and potentially get a finish. So I like the Olberg side. Olberg by TKO is the official pick. I think King Nikolai finally goes down this weekend. And up next in the bantamweight division, Montel Jackson comes in as a minus 200 favorite. The comeback on Julio Arce is plus 175. And this is a fun matchup. Montel Jackson's a guy that fights at a high pace. He's never really in boring fights. And he basically dominated that fight against JP Byes. I know it ended up going to a decision, but that fight could have been stopped. He dropped him multiple times, had him hurt throughout. Montel Jackson's just a guy who I think historically you can't really trust him because you never know if he's fully in. There's been stories about him not focused in training camp, that sort of thing, not training as much, not taking it as seriously as someone you'd like when you see a significant favorite price tag. However, what he makes up for in the lack of, of fighting IQ and focus, he makes up for that in athleticism. And I think that's pretty big here. I think he's going to be the longer fighter on Arche. I think he's going to be able to back Arche up against the fence, mix in takedowns. This is a guy that averages around four takedowns per 15 minutes. And Arche, while I do think he's probably the more skilled fighter, I think all of the intangibles along with the pace and the wrestling favor the Jackson side. So give me Jackson by decision. That's the official pick. Up next in the featherweight division, Sungwoo Choi comes in as a minus 165 favorite with Mike Trezano on the comeback at plus 140. And I like the Choi side in this matchup. I do expect this to be basically a kickboxing match, right? Well, Trezano would theoretically have a grappling edge. You just can't trust on him to use that grappling edge. The guy basically never looks to proactively grapple. I do expect him to be comfortable in the striking here, and the striking should be somewhat competitive. I just favor the power and the technicality of the Sung Woo Choi side. Comes from a high-level striking background. Historically, the way you beat him is you force him to grapple, even though he's been in make, making improvements in those areas. And my concern on the Choi side is his durability, because now we've seen him in a couple fights now where he's been stung really bad, but I don't really worry about the power of Mike Trezano. Historically, he's not a power puncher, doesn't put a ton of volume out there. And if he's not going to look to grapple here, I think the margins are pretty thin in order for him to get his hand raised here. So give me Choi. Choi by decision is the official pick. But again, we have 14 fights on this slate. I think these ones that I'm expecting to go to decision primarily play out in the striking where we probably don't see a finish one way or the other. I think we can avoid this one on DraftKings. Up next, we have the first female fight of the night as Carolina Kovalkiewicz comes in as a small favorite at minus 120 with Silvana Gomez Juarez on the comeback at plus 100. And I slightly lean towards the Kovalkiewicz side. I think she's a more proven fighter. Obviously, she's a veteran of the fight game, but she only has two victories over the last like five or six years. And both of them came against Felice Herrig. That was her most recent win, a second round submission victory. She did end up on the optimal lineup, if I remember correctly on that slate. But in terms of this matchup, I actually don't love this fight. And I think this fight could be popular, so I'm looking to be underweight to this fight as a whole. Reason being, I think Silvana Gomez Juarez, while she does carry some power in terms of the division, she's an extremely low-level fighter. Yes, her only three fights have ended inside the first round so far, but Kovalkiewicz, even though she's a bit towards the back end of at this stage in her career, I don't think that Gomez Juarez is just going to come out there and just flatline her and knock her out early. And then on the flip side, I think most of the finishing equity would have to be in a Carolina by submission 
type deal. And I, I just don't rate that as a super high outcome. So I really think we're probably going to see a full 15 minutes here, primarily striking. And I do think Carolina could put up more volume than Gomez Juarez. And she'd have the grappling upside as well. So I'll say Carolina Kovalkiewicz by decision. But again, I'm sort of just looking to be underweight to the field. It's like in that mid-range, I would much rather play the next fight, like Azatar versus Fervola in a similar price range. So give me Carolina by decision, but overall not a fight that I love this week. And up next, as I mentioned, Otman Azatar comes in as a minus 135 favorite with the comeback on Matt Steamroller Fervola is plus 115. And this is a fight that I really like. You know, we talked about the last couple fights. I didn't love them for DraftKings purposes. I think this is one that you want to have a lot of exposure to. So I'm gonna have one of these two guys in most, if not all of my lineups this weekend. And the reason being is because it's one of those fights that I love where it's like the strengths of one guy sort of play into the weaknesses of the other. And what I mean by that is Otman Azatar, 10 of his 13 wins have come by knockout. Most of his wins have come inside the first round. He hasn't fought for like two years because he had his last fight canceled at Fight Island due to the infamous bag discrepancy. And he ended up getting scrapped from that card. Now he's back, coming off a big layoff. Historically, we don't have much data on him because he's basically just around one or bust style of fighter. And then on the flip side, for Vola, his durability is the main concern. He's been knocked out twice inside the first round. So that early knockout upside for Azatar is certainly within the range of outcomes here. But I think more than likely, if Fervola can survive, I think he goes to the wrestling. He taxes the cardio of Azatar, which I think is pretty much unproven. And I think Azatar's defensive grappling is a leak that Fervola can take advantage of here. Fervola averages around two and a half takedowns per 15 minutes. So as long as he can stay conscious early, I think we see Fervola start to take over. So Fervola by decision is the official pick. The thing I like about that is even priced in the mid-range, in a decision, he can still score well because I'd expect it to come through multiple takedowns, ground and pound, and potentially a finish himself. So give me Fervola by decision. Like I said, I'm going to be looking to be overweight to both sides and this fight as a whole on DraftKings. Up next in the middleweight division, Andre Petrosky comes in as a minus 195 favorite with the comeback on Wellington Terman at plus 165. And I gotta say, I like the Petrosky side here. Petrosky has kind of overperformed relative to what we'd expect coming off of the Ultimate Fighter. Obviously had a loss on the show, but has certainly developed a lot since then. I think his striking has got a little bit better. He's still definitely stiff in striking exchanges, but he does have that powerful left hand that he will look for repeatedly. Obviously comes from the collegiate wrestling background as well. And we've seen the grappling really be more of a threat than I expected coming into the UFC. Either way, I think he's very tough tough fighter, definitely going to be powerful early in the fight, can hang in the grappling here. And I think he would have the striking upside, at least early in the fight, while he does have cardio. And that's my biggest concern with him is he's notorious for dumping after the first, you know, seven minutes or so. He does have a couple round three finishes, but I don't think those came from him being some sort of cardio warrior. I do think that is still a concern for me. And then on the Terman side, this guy's historically not been somebody that you can trust. Yes, he got the submission victory over Misha Surkinov his last time out in February, but he's been knocked out twice inside the first round. I think that's a concern here is Viking's not very good. He averages around two takedowns per 15 minutes, but I'm not sure if he's going to be able to muscle Petrosky to the ground. I think Petrosky is going to be much stronger in the wrestling exchanges. So I like Petrosky here. I'm not betting him at this price, but I do think he wins. Petrosky inside the distance. I lean knockout, not super confident there, but I do think he gets a finish on term in one way or the other. And up next, we have Aaron Blanchfield coming in as one of the biggest favorites on the card at minus 400. The comeback on my girl meatball Molly McCann is plus 300. Molly's been a cash cow for us over her last few fights here. I, I'm definitely going to be rooting for her in this spot, coming off back-to-back -back spinning knockout victories, completely electric, had the entire arena buzzing after that one. So you'd love to see Molly Molly McCann fights. I'm excited for this one. Unfortunately, I can't back her here and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it because I think what it comes down to is even though I think she's the better boxer of the two and I'd favor her if the fight played out in the striking, the problem is she only defends takedowns at 46%, and it's very clear that's going to be the game plan for Aaron Blanchfield here. She averages around four takedowns per 15 minutes. She's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I expect her to land multiple takedowns here and bank some control time. So unless Molly 
can pull the rabbit out of the hat and hurt her with something on the feet again. I don't think she's going to get the victory here. So we're going Blanchfield by decision. That's the official pick. I think it comes through heavy grappling in this one. And up next in the light heavyweight division, Dominic Reyes comes in as a minus 205 favorite with Ryan Spann on the comeback at plus 175. And this is one where I think both guys, you can't really trust either of them, but also both of them are pretty dangerous themselves. So I think it's a good fight to target on DraftKings. I am expecting to see a finish one way or the other. We'll start with the Reyes side. He started his career 12-0. and There was a lot of hype behind him. He's coming for the belt. Ended up losing what was a pretty gutsy performance against John Jones. Ended up losing again after that to Jan Blakovic in another title fight. And then his most recent performance last year against Yuri Prohaska, where he did end up getting finished and lost that one as well. So started 12-0, and lost three in a row, but all of them were to either former or current champions in this division. So you can't really knock him too much for that. You know, I do still think he has power. I do favor the cardio and the durability in this fight. And that's why I lean with the Reyes side. Ryan Spann has always been somebody that I don't really rate super highly. While he does have finishing ability, he stunned me against Ian Kudalaba his last time out, got the first round submission victory. He's a decent submission grappler. He's pretty crafty with a couple of his chokes. He does have some power, but the durability is a huge concern. He's been knocked out multiple times. We've seen him hurt multiple times as well. He's been finishing five of his seven professional losses. So this is one where, again, I think both guys you can't really trust, but I favor the Dominic Reyes side because of the cardio edge, because of the durability edge as well. So I think we see Reyes by knockout. That's the official pick. And up next, we have Hinato Moicano, a minus 120 favorite. The comeback on Brad Riddell is plus 100. And this is a really fun matchup here. I think people are split on both sides in this one, and I totally get it. We have Moicano coming off the short notice main event against Rafael Dos Anjos, where he took an absolute beating in that fight. I unfortunately fell asleep during that fight when it was live because these pay-per-view cards are a little bit late for me, so we'll see if I stay awake on Saturday. But after re-watching it, I saw the beating that he took throughout that fight, and I was kind of surprised he didn't get put away. You know, this is a guy that we've seen knocked out three times in his career. His durability always has been a concern, And now on the Riddell side, I think the durability is a concern just as much on the Riddell side because he's been in multiple wars. He's been hurt in basically every single one of those fights. But I do think he's a better pure technical striker here. I'd favor him in terms of the boxing exchanges. The problem is if he gets taken down, and doesn't work back to his feet immediately, I think Moicano can find the back here. And if Moicano takes his back in this fight, I think he probably chokes him out. But it's also not something that I'm banking on to happen. Riddell does have some okay takedown defense. He's generally pretty squirrely to be able to get back to his feet. So this is a fight where I think both guys can win. Both guys can finish here. So I think this is another one when we talk about the mid-range on DraftKings where we have this fight, we have the Matt Frivola fight that we talked about earlier, and the Carolina fight. Again, I just favor these two fights because I think they're going to score better than that Carolina fight. So that's sort of the stance that I'm making this week as we go through the rest of the week here. So we'll see if anything changes, but I think I'm going to look to be overweight to this fight. I slightly lean Riddell by knockout, but we'll see what happens come Saturday. I'm going to have exposure to both sides across multiple lineups. And before we get to the main card, guys, do me a favor hit the like button, hit that subscribe button. I do videos like this for every single fight card. It's completely free, takes two seconds, and it helps me out a lot. I definitely appreciate it. Let's get on to the main card. And kicking off the main card, we have Dan Hooker, a minus 145 favorite with Claudio Puelas on the comeback at plus 125. And I gotta say, how is Dan Hooker not a bet for you this weekend at minus 145? I do not understand the pricing in this fight. I favor Hooker pretty drastically in this fight. You know, you have Claudio Puelas on one hand who has had, you know, a couple submission victories. He's been impressive at the lower levels. Look at the level of competition. Clay Guida, Chris Gutzmacher, uh, Jordan Levitt. Like, what are we doing here? Dan Hooker has fought the best that the lightweight division has to offer. Dustin Poirier, Michael Chandler, Islam Makachev, the current champ. This dude has fought the best that lightweight has to offer at 155. And I just don't think Claudio Puelas can come compete at that level like Dan Hooker has. I expect Hooker to have a significant striking advantage in this spot. Like I think Puelas, more of a guard player, willing to let guys take him down, fish for submissions off his back. While he is crafty there and maybe could potentially find something here, I just think Hooker has way too many tools for him. I don't think he's going to be able to take Hooker down. I think he could potentially eat a big knee from Hooker coming in. I think Hooker will be able to keep this fight standing and just piece him up on the feet. Hooker by knockout is the official pick and that's going to be a bet for 
me this weekend as well. And after what seems like five or six weeks in a row where we have weird line movement that nobody understands, and then we see a random injury like we have for multiple fight cards now, this is probably going to be the one since it seems so obvious that Dan Hooker should be a bigger favorite here. Everybody's going to pile in and bet Dan Hooker, and then he's probably just going to have a freak injury, get submitted or something like that. But either way, I think I think you got to do it. You got to ride with the boys on this one. Hooker by knockout. That's the official pick. And up next, we have Chris Gutierrez coming in as a minus 215 favorite. The comeback on the veteran Frankie Edgar is plus 185. And this is one where I think you might just need to close your eyes, plug your nose, hold your breath, and back the veteran Frankie Edgar in his retirement fight, 41 years old, at home in Madison Square Garden. I think it's going to be buzzing. Maybe the crowd can will him to victory. At least that's what I'm hoping because really the durability has always been a concern. He's obviously taken some really brutal knockouts at this stage in his career. I don't think you can trust him not to get hurt or not to get knocked out, but I think stylistically speaking, this is a winnable matchup for him against Chris Gutierrez who really has been not much of a power puncher. I know he's coming off a knockout out victory but this guy is basically a leg kicker and while he's great at that one thing he is one dimensional and I think he could be exposed in terms of the wrestling and the defensive grappling we've seen it bite him in the past. Cody Durden took him down multiple times and got a 10-8 in that round while he was fresh. Frankie Edgar has good cardio. I don't expect him to cardio dump like that, especially if he's having that wrestling success early. You look at the fight against Marlon Chito Vera. Yes, he got brutally knocked out his last time out, but he was looking good in that fight. He was very competitive. It was probably 1-1 going into the third round there, but he took Marlon Vera down multiple times, stayed safe in top position, controlled him for like three minutes in in each of those rounds. So I think he could have wrestling success here. I think he can control Gutierrez potentially for extended minutes on the mat. So I think he's a live dog at this price. Like I said, I think you just probably got to back him. Hope he stays conscious. And I think you're holding a valuable ticket there. So give me Frankie Edgar by decision. That's what I'm going to be rooting for. Big fade on Gutierrez on DraftKings and in the betting market. Let's get it, Frankie, one last time. Which brings us to our feature bout on the main card as Dustin the Diamond Poirier comes in as a minus 210 favorite. The comeback on Michael Chandler is plus 185. I got to say, this is the fight that I am most excited about on the entire card. I like both of these guys. I like watching their fights. I think it's going to be an exciting fight. And I like the price here on the dog and Michael Chandler. You know, while Dustin Poirier is certainly still among the best in this division, I think Michael Chandler is is there as well. And I think that might be something that a lot of people kind of disagree with. But one thing that I don't think you can disagree with is that he's very explosive early in fights. This guy's had a ton of finishes over in Bellator and in the UFC. I think he's going to be dangerous early. And I know Poirier has been pretty durable lately, but he's still been knocked out. You know, you have to go back a little bit in his career, but he has been hurt on this run that he's been on as well. And I think the takedowns, I think, would more so come on the Chandler side. I don't trust him to wrestle here, but I do think it's a potential path to victory. If he were to get stung a little bit on the feet, then maybe we see him go to the wrestling. But regardless, I just think this is going to be a much closer fight than a plus 180 would indicate here. I think I'd probably make Poirier like minus 150. Um, So I think there's clear value on Chandler. I'm going to be backing Chandler in the betting market and on DraftKings. I think he's one of the better underdogs to target because he does have that explosive athleticism. He does have round one finishing ability and potentially a wrestling path to victory, even though I don't really expect him to use that. I think for those reasons, you got to like Chandler as an underdog here. So give me Michael Chandler by TKO. That's the official pick come Saturday. Which brings us to our co-main event for the women's strawweight belt as Carla Esparza takes on the challenger, Ailey Zhang, who's looking to regain her belt and should do so as a minus 330 favorite. Carla Esparza on the comeback at plus 275. And I I don't really get the Carla Esparza love here. I know it's a big number, but I have a really hard time seeing her be able to just lay and pray for 25 minutes in order to keep the belt here. I think Wiley Zhang is way more athletic here, way more powerful, huge striking advantage. And even though Carla was able to implement a good game plan, credit to her against Rose Nami Yunus, that was more so Rose's fault for not being able to know that nothing had really happened in a lot of those rounds. So maybe a little bit of cage push and a takedown is enough to swing it and her coaches should have let her know because even after every round she's talking smack she thought she was winning she was fighting like she thought she was up on those cards I think if she fought a little bit differently maybe suspecting that she could have been down I think we would have seen a much different result there and I know that's just me speculating but I think Wiley Zhang has 
potentially even more of that upside in terms of the striking, the power, the athleticism against someone like Carlos Barza, who I think is going to be a pretty big dog on the feet and just desperately needs to get this fight to the ground. If she can get it to the ground, then she does have a path to victory there. It's just like... Even if she's able to do that for a round, maybe two, which I find hard to believe, I think over time, Wiley Zhang is going to be able to work back to her feet, hurt her on the feet, and probably put her away. So give me Wiley Zhang by TKO. That's the official pick, and I think she captured back the belt this weekend. Which brings us to the main event. This one is in the middleweight division. It's for the middleweight strap here. Israel Adesanya comes in as a minus 205 favorite with Alex Perea on the comeback at plus 175. And I like the Izzy side, and I'm not an Izzy fanboy by any means, but I do think you have to respect that he is one of the best technical strikers the UFC has at this moment. And even though Perea does come from a high-level kickboxing background, he's the former glory kickboxing world champion, two-time division champion, and he beat Israel Adesanya two different times in a kickboxing fight. But let's remember, kickboxing and UFC fights are completely different. There's a lot more elements that you have to factor in here. And I think it does favor the Adesanya side. I think Adesanya is way more proven, particularly over five rounds here. Perea, while he's looked good and he's got some hype behind him, I do still have concerns with his cardio, especially if this fight gets extended into the fourth and fifth championship rounds like I expect it to. And his defensive grappling, which really hasn't been tested. Not that that's going to be like a huge game plan for Izzy, but I would favor him if he does mix in some of the different martial arts here. And I I expect Izzy to even be the better striker here. His range management is unmatched. I think he's going to be the one able to get in and out of the pocket, land more than Pereira. We saw Strickland have some success with that early in the fight prior to getting killed by the Pereira left hook. And that's obviously possible. It's, It's a striking fight. Either guy can win by knockout at any moment. But I just favor the Adesanya side for all those things we talked about. I think it's a prove-it spot for Perea that he deserves to be here. I'm not convinced that he does, and even at this number, I don't have any interest backing him. I'm closer to backing Adesanya. It's probably going to be a no bet for me, but I don't hate, you know, if you need one last parlay piece, I don't hate throwing the champ in there simply because I'm not sure if Perea is going to be able to hang for 25 minutes here with the champ. So give me Israel Adesanya by decision. That's the official pick. And as always, guys, you could check out fightnumbers.com where I'll have DraftKings player rankings broken down by salary tier. I'll have ownership projections, a couple other tools on there as well. It's completely free, fightnumbers.com. And as always, best of luck. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time.